Based on their head, they're probably seeing the people who are going to be responsible for their death. Using a rifle, it is a very efficient machine, but it's only as good as the operator. These people were not sharpshooters, they were civilians. Regardless of whether or not they were actually aiming for the heart, you couldn't really tell where they were going to hit the person. Uh, they could hit them in the shoulder, they could hit them in the leg. Even if one person missed trying to fire for the heart. Fire! Chances of five people missing while shooting for the heart was pretty slim. More than likely, this person was going to die either very quickly of hemorrhagic shock or an actual hit to the heart or the head. To skillfully aim a rifle demands complete focus on the part of the trigger man. But a reluctance to take another person's life can psychologically affect the accuracy of the gunman. Humans usually will go along with an authority figure. When you're talking about execution, that's a hugely powerful psychological tool. If you can convince somebody that they're no longer really responsible for what they're doing, that person is much more likely to do what you tell them to do. To minimize the potential for human error, the penal system creates a psychological ruse. There were a lot of psychological aspects uh, designed to make this whole process easier for the people carrying it out. You could have been told that one of the people shooting was actually firing blanks. You put a hood over the person's head, uh, dehumanizing them. You didn't have to see their face. You had a big target put on them, so really you only had the one thing to focus at, rather than looking at the whole person as the thing you were shooting. There were a lot of things there to really assuage your guilt over actually thinking about killing another human being. Hey! If after all of these civilians had failed to kill this person, only then would the leader have to go up and actually shoot the victim in the side of the head. In this last volley, we had three pretty good shots. One looked like a kill shot, but in the event that the rounds did not kill the individual right away, and he was still alive, it would be the job of the officer in charge to walk up with his pistol, chamber around, and shoot the individual in the head, basically giving him the coup de grace. In a backlash to the gun violence of the early 1970s, the firing squad rapidly falls out of favor. But to this day, condemned criminals in Idaho and Oklahoma can still request this form of execution. Around the world, as many as 80 other countries continue to use firing squads as their primary form of execution. It persists for the same reasons it began, a ready supply of guns and an endless stockpile of bullets. Of all the modern day advances, the control of electricity is certainly one of the most revolutionary. Electricity is everything to the modern world. Try and think of something that doesn't use electricity. It's everywhere. We cannot see electricity, but we certainly know the impact it has. And with the invention of a single machine, electricity completely energized the modern execution. They call this device the electric chair. Since it was a modern day machine, really it was sort of designed with the best of intentions. Uh, they designed it thinking it would be more humane, a less cruel way of punishment, a less inhumane way of carrying out execution. Whether or not that's actually the case is kind of up for debate. In the electric chair, a condemned prisoner becomes part of a closed circuit. Electricity leaves the power supply as electrons move through the wire. The electricity then enters the headpiece, travels through a conductive sponge soaked with saline, and enters the skull. The electrical current then courses through the human body, exiting from an electrode on the leg, where a second conductive sponge sends it right back to the power supply. The typical electrocution cycle starts with a high voltage jolt and ends with a lower one. 
when they're brought into the execution room, uh, obviously you see the chair sitting there. It really only has one purpose. You know you're not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, you have to be sit sat down in the chair, be strapped to it. You've got the electrodes being attached to both your head, your legs being shaved so the electrode can be placed onto there. Uh, it's a very real experience and no matter how much you've been putting it off until then, uh, all of a sudden it's going to come home. Contrary to popular belief, the electric chair is not electric. No current travels through any part of the structure. So just about any sturdy non-conductive chair can serve as a front row seat to an electrocution. So the human body is really just there to bridge the gap between the two electrodes, just letting the electricity conduct all the way through. But just how much voltage does it take to electrocute the condemned? The electric chairs uh, maybe vary from 1600 volts to uh, perhaps a high of 2600 volts in recent years. And here we have an array of 8100 watt light bulbs. We could visualize the amount of energy, say, of one of the lower energy chairs, and it would look something like this. All of these light bulbs are the equivalent of 1600 volts. A typical household outlet delivers just 120 volts. So the electric chair has 13 times more voltage than household current. In order to drive this much energy into a person, uh, it takes a lot of voltage. So to do that, they either need a transformer to step the voltage up or a generator, but something that delivers much more power than a home outlet. The power is supplied from a control system in an adjacent room. This is where the high voltage current of electricity is unleashed through the condemned. The entire electric cycle lasts from 15 to 30 seconds, but it's not the voltage that kills you. Think of it uh, as though voltage is a pump, capable of pumping electricity. And think of electricity like water flowing in a pipe, the wire being pipes. The bigger the pump, the more water it will push through the pipe. During an electrocution, it's actually the amperage or rate at which electricity flows into the victim that's lethal. Just one amp can kill a human, but how it kills is up for debate. Some people have inferred from the idea that the skull insulates the brain that not enough electricity will get to the brain to shut it down during an electrocution. There's a simple visual test to observe if voltage can travel through the skull directly into the brain. It requires a purchase from the local butcher shop to simulate the human brain. Here we have brain matter and we have bone to simulate skull. We're going to use an oscilloscope to see if current does get to the brain even when you apply voltage to the skull. An oscilloscope is a device that translates voltage into a graphic display. When there is no voltage, the screen is black or shows a flat line. So there's no electric current running through the brain tissue right now. I'm going to introduce some with a stun gun. This is about 2,000 volts. You're going to be able to see the current in between the two electrodes until I pass it into the brain. That current will disperse throughout the brain tissue. You'll see it register here on the oscilloscope until I pull the electrodes back out. So now there's a baseline. The oscilloscope shows high voltage traveling through the brain matter. As humankind begins to understand electricity in the modern age, executioners capitalize on its lethal attributes. The inventors of the electric chair know that electricity can kill, but they don't know how. One theory is that the skull insulates the brain from the electric jolt. As a result, the electricity kills the brain by cooking it. An initial baseline test shows that high voltage travels easily through brain matter. But the brain is protected by the skull, and it's the skull where the voltage first hits the victim. Some people think because the skull insulates the brain that not enough electricity will get to the brain to shut it down during an electrocution. So we're going to use a piece of bone to simulate skull. And I'm going to zap the skull and see if we still get the same readout from the brain tissue. 
you can see, still quite a bit of electricity going through the brain tissue, even when it has to pass through the skull.